Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's the 16th of May and the Stanley Cup playoffs have started. But here we are still talking about regular season hockey. I never thought we'd see the day that regular season hockey was being played while well, the playoffs are in progress. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, we got three games to go this year, all against the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, what I'm hoping for is for the Winnipeg Jets to sweep the Edmonton Oilers and for Calgary to split the three games with Vancouver so that way both Vancouver and Cal- uh, Vancouver and Calgary can their fans can say that we had more playoff wins than Edmonton or wins the- during the playoffs, pardon me. There you go. That you got to be you got to preface that very carefully. Wins during the the days the first round games were played. Yeah. Um, well, let's look back at last week. Last week we had our uh, friend of the show Mike Gold on to talk to us about the Stockton Heat and and what was going on there. And uh, that same day the Calgary Flames played a game against the Ottawa Senators. And Matt, we finally done it. We beat the the Ottawa Senators. It's almost like beating the final boss in a in a video game. We finally made it to the end and. Beat the Senators, a big 6-1 win last Sunday for the Flames. Um, goals from Johnny Goudreau, Michael Backlund, Matthew Kachuk, Michael Stone, Dylan Dubé, and Mark Giordano. So six goals, six scorers on this one. Uh, what do you think of the Flames in this game? Oh, um, wish that this team had like an extra 10 games to go in the season. Like I fi- feel like this team finally... like. A- as they, they feel like they to, finally got things together. Yeah, and it's so disappointing because it, it's looking like if they're going to play the next three games against Vancouver, that they have a good chance of beating Vancouver in all three of those games. And, you know, like the Flames could end up finishing two points out of a playoff spot. And, you know, it's one of those situations where if the they had played 66 games this year instead of 56, I think the Flames make the playoffs. It's just too little too late and just very frustrating because it, this team actually looks like they are playing a lot better under Daryl and have their stuff together for a change. And hopefully, I mean, you know, we never know what... uh you know, what a summer break can bring, whether it's going to help or hurt. But I think coming out of a summer break, um, hopefully we'll see them be able to ride that momentum into next year and take this same, you know, play style that we're seeing under Daryl and, uh, you know, apply it right from the beginning next year. Yeah, well, if you look at this team, like, I think that, like, this last month that they've actually been playing well, if they uh, were able to... Like, if they did not play as well as they have this past month, I think that this team would have been more in line for a complete teardown. And, you know, like a full-on, let's just rebuild this, because, like, the whole thing is kind of gone awry. And and I, and I think it goes back to what you and I have talked about, right? The pieces are here. They just weren't all firing on all cylinders for some reason. Yeah, and like you have to figure that Monahan and Kachuk are going to be better next year because you know, they both had a really down year and with so much money being freed up via the moves that were made that this team should be able to actually address some of the higher end scoring depth issues that they've had. Um Namely, getting a good right winger or two to fill out this roster. And, you know, it's been frustrating for so much of this season because it's like this team has almost everything they need. It's just the whole engine isn't quite clicking together in stride yet. And this last run, including the game against Ottawa, this team is starting to get on the right track and get going i mean we're in the 50s now for games and if this is an 82 game season i mean it might not it might not then be too little too late but you're not going to probably make it higher than fourth you know fourth in the division if that was the case well if this had been an 82 game schedule i think that the flames might eventually be pushing edmonton for their spot in second um just because of the nature of how 
well they're playing that they probably would make a huge push to ascend in the standings but uh, you know it, it is what it is and this season is bizarre and you know on one hand it is it disappointing that the flames are missing the playoffs yes but they're going to get a good player in the draft and it helps to reevaluate the whole organization really and place new emphasis on certain things and perhaps less emphasis on others in order to readjust the whole lineup top to bottom. You're talking about a couple guys that weren't looking great, Kachuk and Monahan, and one of those guys scored in the uh the Canucks game on uh later this week. That was on uh, that was on Thursday. So Monahan did not play in that game. And we'll come back to this point, but Monahan's been shut down for the season to get surgery. But Kachuk looked good in this game. He got a goal. Uh, Kachuk, Lindholm, Monjapani, and Rasmus Anderson all got goals in a 4-1 win over the Canucks here at the Dome to kick off this five-game series. Markstrom made 24 saves in his 14th straight start for the Flames. And uh, the Flames are now, they're what? They got a three-game winning streak going on. So, like you said, starting to to pull some things together. What would you think of this Vancouver game? Well, again, uh, this is more of like the efforts that you would expect them to be throwing against teams like Vancouver, like Ottawa. Still not where, perfect games, no, but they're looking a lot better. Yeah, you're playing better than the lousy opponent, and you're putting them away. What you should do. And like what they should have done with Ottawa all season, and what they have been successful in doing against Vancouver. Yeah, and it's... You know, it's, like you said, kind of frustrating to see this now when it doesn't matter. But I think it's good to see. I think, you know, this month in general, the way since the Edmonton game on the first, Kuchuk's been looking more like himself. I think, um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of guys showing a glimmer of what they can be. And I, I don't necessarily think, sort of like you were saying earlier, I don't think this maybe staves off some big moves the team has to make. I don't think they're going to blow it up, but I still think we might see some big names get moved. Um, but I think that even if you do make those moves, because guys are starting to look better, you might get a little more value for some of those guys. And maybe one or two death players who maybe wouldn't have been back or might have been moved might stay. Yeah, and like you're looking at... Uh, the player, two players that I'm specifically going to mention are uh, Dylan Dubé and Andrew Mangiapane, and I think that both of them are quickly establishing themselves as good top nine forwards, and they're going to need more opportunities at the highest levels to see if they can become those top notch forwards that and i think even these next three games are especially with uh, monahan out these are good games to move one of them up to those top two lines yeah and like it'll be interesting to see exactly what this organization does down the middle because um like i touched on it last week with mike that like i over the long term i view monahan as being more effective as a left winger than as a center um, just because of the fact that, um, just defensively, I do not think that he's adequate enough, uh, to play the center position effectively full time. But, but you've already got two top left wingers. I can't see them moving them there just for that reason. I think well, they try to convert them that, to right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, it, it, I would be more likely to see Goudreau or Kachuk move over to the right side and do it that way unless uh, you think unless you think maybe Gaudreau leaves and then you've got you know uh, again an opening there yeah like there's a whole different set of calculations like specifically with that but I think that like there are my moving, only moving my I don't want to say my of, only concern but I don't I think it's going to be expensive to replace a centerman yeah oh for sure but um like, on a temporary basis, you could run Lindholm and Backlund as your first and second line center. But how long a year on a temporary two. basis? Well, that's like a year or two. And I don't think that's temporary at this point. This team, I think, has two years left until this core's, you know, got to be blown up. Yeah, well, 
Um, I guess the question is, is Backlund your second line? I mean, if if we're close to making it to the, the let's say, the third round, fourth round, is Backlund your number two center for that? No. And frankly, like this organization is kind of at a bit of a crossroads because of there are two huge question marks. Does Kachuk return to his form? And does Monaghan? And because uh, both of them had a significant step back this year and Kachuk partially due to the, that concussion in the playoffs last year, he hasn't really like throughout this season, hasn't looked himself. And well, let's come, let's come back to that. Let's wrap up this week and then we'll talk about those two guys. Yeah. So with those two games played, Calgary stills in fifth, obviously not making the playoffs at this point. They now sit after 53 games at 51 points overall, tied with Ottawa, but we have uh, three games in hand there. Um, Vancouver still at 47 points, the last in the division. So Calgary, I'm imagining, is going to pass Ottawa here. Um, as long as we get at least you know one win, we'll pass Ottawa but still be in fifth. So let's come back to that point, Matt. Let's talk about Monaghan first. Monahan got shut down uh, before the Vancouver game. He's going to be out for the rest of the season with a hip injury that he's getting operated on. And, you know, you and I have talked about Monahan and what is his value going forward? And if you look at this guy, he's had his left wrist reconstructed, two hernia surgeries, a procedure on his groin, now a hip surgery. Am I missing something? Like, it just seems like every summer there's something wrong with him and he's... He, whatever he was or could have been, I think he's not going to be that anymore with that many surgeries. So I really think at this point you have to ask, is he, I, I think he could be a number two, but I don't think you can look at him anymore as a guy in his mid twenties with that many surgeries as your number one. No. And I think that's where like this team is found themselves in quite a bit of a pickle because of the fact that like they, desperately now need a top six center in the organization coming up through the pipeline and no offense to Connor Zari, but uh, you know, well, he's he, a couple he, years away. I know, but like even him, like he would have to hit a home run in terms of his developmental tra trajectory to become a top six center in the NHL. So let, let's let's look at this roster a little bit. If you're the coach next year, do you put Elias Lindholm at center or at right? Center. Okay, so he's your number one. So then we need a we need a right winger for the first line, a right winger for the second line. If you do you think that Goudreau is better to be here or to be used as a piece to acquire one of those things? Well, part of the problem is is that the Flames, outside of Gaudreau, do not have any dynamic offensive talent. Yeah. But do you think like, you could use Gaudreau to acquire that kind of a centerman? You, uh, frankly, like if you're trading Gaudreau for a center, you're going to get a second-line center of equivalent age. And but we're saying that's what we need, right? If Lindholm's your first-liner. Yeah, but um, how would you say... Uh, in terms of talent, like, more towards Backland than towards Gaudreau. Okay. In terms of offensive skill. Like, not even a guy that's like Nazim Kadri level uh, as a center. Because wingers, like, they're valuable, but not as much as a center. So, like, you're not going to get a legitimate top line or second line like a good offensive second line center so, for Gaudreau so in your case then if you move Sean Monaghan to left now you've got uh Kachuk you've got um Backland or sorry you've got Kachuk you've got Goudreau and you've got Monaghan on the left naturally do you try to convert one of those guys to right or do you move one of those guys for right what do, what do you think is the better move there well, I think that you start by playing somebody on the right side, and I'd probably throw Gaudreau on the right side just because it just, he's cerebral enough of a player that I think that anywhere he's on the ice, he's a, a weapon. So when you say start, I mean, you're you're not going to get a guy mid-season unless you make a deal at the, at the deadline for something like that. So are you saying that that's your solution for next season? Uh, that is a solution. 
Like, what, basically, like, what I would have in mind if you do move Monahan to the wing, um, it just creates a little bit more options in terms of both trades and free agency, because, you know, like, it, with there being a large amount of right wings and centers available in free agency this year, that it just opens up uh, other options that you might be able to get a decent second line center for just the UFA contract price. We, and it, it'd be more of a veteran guy, but you could go that route versus, you know, be, and then move Gaudreau over to the right side, or you could sign the right winger and keep Monahan as the center. Well, it's one of those, you could, it, I think that like the availability of what's actually available on the market would dictate what you do with Monaghan. Well, let's explore some of those a little bit and let's look at some of the free agents. I think that if you're going to move Monaghan um, to left, I, I don't I don't know that moving Goudreau to the right is the solve to the right wing problem. I don't know that moving any of these guys is. We've tried Kachuk over there. It didn't work. I don't think you just move a left winger and go, now we got a right winger. I think if you want to move Monaghan to the left, Someone's got to get moved out for a right winger, be that through trade or through free agency. Yeah. So let let's assume that you're saying, and I don't disagree with you, but you're saying that moving Goudreau isn't going to get you the center you need. So let's look at what we might be able to acquire then as second line centermen on the on the free agent market. And I'll go through some of the top names here. Uh, Ryan Getzlaff, I think, is too old. Uh, he'd be viable for a year or two. Uh, David. Krejci out of Boston, I think, is going to get too much money. I think someone yeah, else Yeah, and he'll be more. re-signed more than likely than not. Paul Stasny? I'd take him. Derek Stepan? I'd take him, too. He's not too bad. Uh, Zetterberg, I don't want to touch. He's 40. Well, he, he's retired, due, but not oh, that's due true. to injury. Yeah. No, you're right. That's uh, Yeah, I'm just seeing him on the list here, and I totally forgot he's retired. Uh, David Backus? No, he's bad. <laughs> Nugent Hopkins is going to want too much, and someone else um, will, pay, will overpay him. If he came in at like five and a half, six million, sure. He's making six right now. I don't see that he takes a pay cut. I think somebody's going to. He's the youngest center on this list at twenty eight. I think someone will give him a payday. Yeah, I just I don't view him as being. It, like, uh, the most I'd go for him would be six and a quarter. I agree, but I think there's a team out there that would give him in the seven range. Yeah, which then, good for him. <laughs> at that Brandon, rate. Brandon Dubinsky? Nah. He's Travis a little, Zajac? Uh, Zajac, eh, he's a little on the old side. Uh, uh, if the Flames needed a third or fourth line guy, then Zajac might make sense. Zajac's same age as Getzlaff, though. I know, uh, but... Zajac's also not the caliber of player that Getzlaff is. Okay, Tyler Bozak. Uh, again, if third, fourth center, like it in that situation, you'd be having Backlund as the number two, and Bozak as being the number three. Artem Anisimov. Same thing. Uh, Marcus Johansson. Uh, you're getting into the weeds now of meh. There's only I'll only go a few more of these. Nick Bjorkstead. I think it's, a good number three, but I don't think a replacer yeah. number two. Yeah. He'd be a like a Derek Ryan replacement. What about Michael Granlin? Uh too slow. So those are your top centerman options. So I mean if we are going to try and acquire that centerpiece, there's very few guys there that I think we have the money to spend, considering we need to spend on a couple other things like a backup that I think we would be able to spend money on to bring in as that number two center. Yeah. So For I'm sure. not... And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where... And if you're looking for a dynamic score, like you were saying, I don't well, really somebody, see one out, outside of Nuge in that, in that list. Yeah, it, it would be one of those where the... Um, the market, I think, would dictate whether you move Monaghan off center or not. Okay. And like, if you can get that second line center, then you go for that over the winger and you play ring around the Rosie with the wingers 
moving Monahan to the wing and somebody over to the other side. I just and, think that of, of those kind of guys like Bozak, like um, you know Getzlav, I think you could acquire a center like that through trade if you needed to. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's one of those, like, Calgary's in a bit of a weird spot because of the fact that they don't have a ton of prospects, period, that are really due to make the NHL with any speed. Like, Zari and Peltier are good, but, and potentially have top six upside, but, like, they're still two, three years away. And, you know, and that's provided that they do go on that upward trajectory. So, I mean, let's assume you're not going to get the dynamic scorer. And let's assume that, okay, let's go back to Monaghan for a sec. With all Monaghan's injuries, is he worth keeping around as the second line, left wing, center, wherever you're going to use him? Or do you say, you know what, this guy's been hurt enough, let's try to get some value for him, even if we're not going to get full market value? Well, the thing is, is that... If I'm a team buying him, uh, and uh, I you you can go around the league, honestly, the most with his contract that I'd be willing to offer is maybe a second round pick. You know, because he makes a lot of money. He had a really bad year, and he's been hurt again. Like yeah. you're not gonna get anything for him, and like. It, is a second round pick or equivalent prospect going to be worth it to you? And if that's a yes and you want to go and spend his six million dollars elsewhere, that's fine. Well, that's what I'm wondering now. Wondering if just moving him to get the cap room if you're trying to bring one of these guys in. I mean, if you want to bring in a Nugent Hopkins at six, you're yeah. looking at about the same money. Yeah, and like that's where like one of the reasons why I've suggested like uh having Giordano go in the expansion draft just to free up the money to spend elsewhere and like it's tough cuz like especially with the cap being flat like everybody's kind of treading water and most teams are spending near the cap and it's hard to like unless you're like James kneeling the contract and getting you know, Milan Lucic, like uh, some other teams, also difficult problem contract. Like, you're not really going to get anything for Monaghan. And to be honest, like, if his hip was bothering him from the get-go this season and he was just playing through it, that would explain why he just fell off the face of the earth in his production. Yeah, but it seems like every year he's got son. What's next year's thing going to be? What's the year after that? Well, gonna be? Like, uh, so, that's at where some point, if, even if you don't move him, I think he might be on his last deal here. Well, that's what I'm trying to say is like, let him get healthy, play good next season, and either trade him at the deadline or at the draft next year, provided he doesn't get hurt again. Yeah, that makes yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not saying you necessarily move him, but I guess we need I think with a guy of his age who's had this many injuries, I think you have to start asking the question of yeah. you know, is is what's the long-term value of this player and I don't know that it's what it once was. N- uh not at all. I I yeah. So I, let's I how would you say with both well, basically everybody on the forward group outside of Lindholm and maybe Kachuk. I don't really view, and like the kids like Dubé and Wanjapane, I don't really view anybody as a core piece anymore. Well, let's go back to this idea of bringing guys in and what's available on free agency. Here's the right shot right wingers. I filtered out left shot right wingers because I think if the Flames are going to go big, they're going to bring in a right shot right winger. Would you agree? Yep. Uh, best one on the bunch is, I think, Sam Reinhardt. Currently making 5-2. I think you might be able to convince Reinhardt to come here, but it's going to be costly. I think you get him for 6-2. Around 6, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say 6, 6.5. Yeah. Would Reinhardt be your top RW? Yeah. He's on a 40-point season this year in Buffalo. If you put him with, you know, Kachuk or Goudreau and Lindholm, I think he could get those same numbers or better. Yep. Um... 
Some other names there. Kyle Palmieri, not a guy that you're going to make your number one right winger. No, he'd be, how would you say, if you're signing him to be, like, it, it, building the organization, like, if you either pencil Goudreau in as the right winger, you trade Goudreau for a right winger, or whatever, um, a guy like Palmieri would be an excellent 2-3 guy to split time with uh, Munjapane. For sure. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with that. Um, Andre Case, as, uh, oh, he's RFA. Uh, Joel Armia, again, could be a good 2-3 guy. Yeah, he'd be more a 3-4 guy, but he'd be a good 3-4 guy. Um, and that's really, I mean, there's not a lot of names on this list. Alex Chason's not your guy. Wayne Simmons isn't your guy. Colton Seaver isn't your guy. Bobby Ryan, Nikita Gustav, or Gusev, uh, Vinny Henestrosa. Like, these are all kind of third-line right-wingers. Yeah, pretty much. Kyler Yamamoto. Um, and then we started to get into the Josh Levo group, which is, I mean, we tried that and it didn't work out. Um, I guess the only other question is, do you, would you look at Brandon Sutter out of Vancouver? But again, I don't see him as a number two. No, he'd be another good number three. So, I mean, looking at that, I think that you're going to have to, unless you can get Reinhardt, you're going to have to trade your way into a top line right winger. There's just yeah. none available to buy. Well, and the, that's why I was uh, making the suggestion of flipping Goudreau over to that right side, provided you could get a second line center and kind of deal with what you've got basically because like the flames are kind of in a weird spot where things are kind of we're not in a good spot and like frankly like under a normal set of circumstances you'd have insert prospect a getting ready to come in that you could actually slot in and, you know, a guy like Manjapane or Dubé might be able to ascend in the rankings and in the lineup to become that guy. But that would be more of an unexpected development than, you know, because like right now I view Manjapane as a good second line right winger. I don't know if I'd go that far. Looking around the league, I think I'd say he's an adequate second line right winger. He could turn into a good one, but I think maybe we're giving him the homer advantage. But I think if I look around the league at second line right wingers, I don't know. I put him in the good camp. When I look at good, I guess I'm thinking: Is this a guy that on another team could ascend to first line right winger? You know, like there's yeah. always those guys where it's like they're second because there's a guy better than them, and I don't think you'd find a lot of teams no. that would put Monjapani as their number one. No, it would basically be the rebuilding teams, more or less. Um, but, um, no, and I think that... How would you say? I, I tend to view, like, top six forwards as, like, are you legitimately pulling your weight as a top six forward? Yeah, and I but, think I, he, but I think I, And I say, I qualify that as being good. Like, I didn't view, like, when David Moss and... Curtis Glencross were being shoehorned in at, but those as guys a second were line guys. Pulling your weight no matter where you're in the lineup is as expected. Yeah, well, uh, Calgary is in a weird spot where, like, if you're doing your job well, that's more of a surprise. So, you know. So if we're, if we're going to move a, a left winger to right, let's just play with that idea here, and then we'll talk about, well, we'll talk about Kachuk because that's the name I'm going to bring in there. But the Flames have tried Kachuk on the right wing a lot. I think if... You're going to move a guy from left to right. It would probably be Kachuk because he seems to have some comfort comfort there. They've done it a few times. Uh, he's played with Goudreau and Lindholm uh, last game on the right. Like I think if you're going to convert one of them, you convert Kachuk. Now, I know you've given Kachuk a lot of, um, l I, I don't want to say criticism, but criticism this year that he's not playing the way he was. You'd mentioned the players meeting earlier that we all talked about, the concussion. You've even mentioned maybe a move him. It's one bad season. To me, I think you've got to wait and see what he does to bounce oh, back. He's a sure. young player. I don't think you now say, well, he's not our, our core guy because he had a bad season. Show me a, a top player for any team that hasn't had a bad year. Oh, for sure. It's just with him specifically, like, uh, uh, how would you say it? I view him as, frankly, the most important player in the organization. And so, like, if he's... 
taking a severe step back to, like, what he is mm-hmm. this season, like, he is, you know, that changes, like, the entire dynamic of where For this sure, team but, is. But I think we have to... We have to go by next season to find that out. I think coming in. Oh yeah, this, for sure. And and even our GM has said this: you can't evaluate guys so much based on this year. You've got to look at their, you know, their whole body of work. And oh, I think for if sure. we if we go by that, Kachuk, I have no reason to believe he's not going to bounce back. And, and we're already starting to see it. And he's also, I think, a, a very Daryl Sutter player. And I think you know, after having a summer and now knowing what Daryl expects. I can see him flourishing under Daryl Sutter next season. I could as well. And part of what I view as, like, the reason why the Flames, like, over the last, frankly, 15 years where they've struggled is that level of complacency of what I'm doing is okay just because I'm here and doing it. And... You know, like, when you see guys like Kachuk, like Monaghan, like Gaudreau at times where, like, the the intensity and, like, just the internal drive and improving and focus, it's not there with the regularity that it should. And that's where... But is that something we can blame on the players? Like you said, that's over 15 years. I think that that's... I mean, we've gone through many managers. We've gone through many coaches. Why has that been an issue if you think it has for 15 years? Is that something from ownership? Um, well, Is it just play good enough to put butts in the seats and we don't care what happens after that? Well, partially, it's an ownership thing. Um, because, frankly, up until them hiring Daryl again... The Flames have had bad coaching since Daryl was the coach. And hiring retreads that were well past their prime or guys that had no experience. And then, oh, well, gee, magically they don't know how to coach at the NHL level. And that falls squarely on the ownership. And that's part of the reason why the Flames haven't taken that next step. Because you you look at Florida, a couple years ago they hired Joel Quenville. And they were not very good. But Joe Quenville taught them how to be good, and now they're in the playoffs and looking like a contending team for the Cup this year. Now, it's one of those things. Sometimes you actually have to spend money where it's actually important, and throughout the Flames' history, since they've been in Calgary... They haven't really had a huge emphasis on coaching where, like, in the 80s and 90s, like, after Terry Crisp left, if they had hired, say, like, a Scotty Bowman or equivalent caliber of coach, Calgary probably would have won another cup or two in the early 90s. But it's been, like, an organizational screw-up basically since they've been in Calgary, where when it's become necessary to actually spend money on coaching, which that is the starting point that breeds the success in the players, the Flames just cheap out on it, and then magically every time the the team continually underperforms, and... It's the same story, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. They're they're great on paper, the results suck. So we've got the guy you want. You've been you've been harping yes. on them bringing Daryl back. So what? How do we fix that now that we have a coach that you think is the right guy? Well, part of it is willing to do risky things. Like what? Um, less emphasis on. Like putting Brett Ritchie on the second line? Um, less emphasis on maintaining players that you've had because the fans know them. Okay. Um, because, frankly, any Canadian hockey team fan will care about the team and cheer for the team regardless of who they put out on the ice. So they just want to actually win games. And, you know, I feel that at times this organization is also 
been reticent to trade big name players because oh the fans will be upset and i think that in order for this team to take that next step they need to build a culture one and that that's where daryl and like any if you've had any good coach in your organization it you it builds a culture based off of the coach that's really the starting point so who's the who are the big name players you think we need to move out of here honestly outside of the three young defensemen uh dube manjapane and kachuk there's not not really a ton where i say oh this guy absolutely we must keep him you're not going to turn over your whole team. In no, one of year, course so, no, so of course not. No, if you're trying to make not. a statement, like you're saying, you're saying we're going to get rid of the big name player and change the culture. Who's the guy that does that for you? Joachim Nordstrom doesn't do that for you. No. Uh, well, for starters, Mark Giordano goes. Okay. Um, just because a we need his cap hit. Two, he's thirty-eight, and three, we need to change, but. Like, it, basically, the Flames, in a lot of ways, need to end the status quo. And, you know, like, and Michael Backlund's the only other guy, and I wouldn't trade him just because he is so damn good at his job okay. that so, I wouldn't so the, be rushing so, to get hit, rid of him. So the captain's gone. We have a bunch of number five jerseys on sales, Fanatic. That changes the culture? Not yet. And okay, I so, think that's where uh, number 13 and number 23... So would you move those guys then, like you were saying earlier, uh, Monaghan, you might get a second for him in your opinion. Do you move him for that second just to make those changes? I. It's one of those things that I wouldn't pull that deal right now. I would wait until he gets healthy again. I'm also not viewing this team as like in contender mode next year. I, I'm viewing this as retool mode. And maximize what you've got if you can and make tweaks to the organization and like fix the damage basically so in that and, case some of those deals then might happen next year at the deadline yeah or next year at the draft one or the other well i, I think you'll probably get better deals for at least one of those guys at the deadline when teams yeah. tend to overpay for guys like that yeah for sure and that's where it, you know and again with all of this, I not like other than Giordano. Giordano is the only deal that I would want to have done this off season for sure. And do you get rid of Giordano at all costs, whether that's exposing him, whether that's trading him for a fifth, or are you waiting for the right market condition to come up? Um, I would be put this way: I would offer Seattle a third to take Giordano. Okay. So, like, literally give them something to make sure that they take him. If you're going to do that, I bet you could shop him around the league and find someone else to take him for a third. Well, the thing is, is that we need somebody eligible to in the expansion draft, and uh, that's why. Um, yeah, even then, I think if... It, I'm just saying that even if he's in the expansion draft, doesn't get taken, I bet you can move him after that for a pick. Because Oh, yeah, not, for sure. I'd rather do that than charge some or, you know, pay somebody to take them off our hands for, for nothing. I think there's no, some value um, there. Yeah, no, like, how would you say? If Seattle decided to, say, sign Derek Ryan or take Shillington or Matthew Phillips instead, which they could. That's also why I threw out the idea of t offering a third just to... You know, make sure, like, the Edmonton uh, James Neal third that we got, you know, here, take that. Um, it's more to, A, get, the most important thing is reallocating that salary. Um, because it, Mark Giordano still is a $6 million defenseman, and that's fine. It's just that there is no future for that asset in this organization like it, it it's not like he's 28 in which case you no, you don't trade him but it's both moving on culture wise onto a different captain and a different identity for this team 
and freeing up cash. And I think that's the most important thing is freeing up the cash. So that way the Flames can go and make a trade for a forward if they need it or sign a different defenseman or, 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 or. So if we go back to what the Flames identity has been, not what we maybe wanted to change to, but if we go back to that same identity of keeping guys for too long, and let's say they hang on to Giordano in the offseason. As you mentioned, you don't think that they're going to be contenders next year. Giordano has one more year on his contract. I don't think that Giordano is your top-line defenseman on this team anymore, but I still think he has value to work with a younger player oh, for further sure. down the lineup. Would If they do keep him and they move him down, and maybe they try to move him at the deadline, do you think it's time to maybe just take the C off him to make that change? Possibly. It, it, like, if you I, come into next year and you make a Chuck or Monaghan your captain instead. Honestly, and I know this is going to sound weird, but if I'm taking the captaincy away from uh, Giordano, I'm giving that letter to Malan Lucic. See, I, I suggest that earlier this season, and I got a lot of guff for it, but I think Lucic... I think is a good interim captain. I don't know he's, again, your long-term guy, but he's the veteran. He's well-respected in the room. Yeah, he's not our top-line guy. He's not fans' favorite, but I agree with you. I yeah. think until until the next guy's ready, let's say that... Let's it's... assume that... Let's assume that Kachuk is the next is the next heir apparent. So you take maybe the C off uh, Giordano, you give it to Lucic for the rest of his contract, which is till 2023, then he gives it up to Kachuk after that. Yeah. That makes sense. And I think just doing that, even if you don't get rid of a player, I think you could signal a new era by switching the C. Yeah. And I'm going to say something slightly controversial. Milan Lucic was the Flames' best player this season. I think that Lucic doesn't get a lot of respect from fans because he's not the top scorer. He's not, he doesn't always look, you know, he's only playing 10 minutes a night or whatever. So his errors get magnified. When you're playing, you know, eight minutes a night, your error on one shift looks a lot bigger than it does over a 20 minute body of work. But I agree with you. I think that Luch does a lot. And you know me, Matt, I've been and spent a lot of time with this team, not this year, but in previous years in the room, you know, talking to these guys, that sort of thing. Luch is always the leader there. He's great with the media. He's great with the young guys. He's a leader behind the scenes. I think there's a lot more to Luch than fans see. I don't know if I'd call him the best player, but I think he's definitely one of the the silent leaders on this team. Yeah, for sure. And that's and I why. think even just that swap from Neil to Lucic, you brought in leadership. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I'm. I brought that up earlier this season. I said I give Lucic a C, and I, I still stand by that. I've got a lot of people give me flack for that, but I think that that's the... I, yeah. I'm not of the belief you need your best player to be your captain. I'm of the be belief you need your leader to be your captain. And to me, Lucic is that if Gio's not. And I think just making... If Gio doesn't leave, I think just making that change of captains um, signals a new, a new era here. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, you know, I think that with how, like, the last few seasons have gone, just the psychological change, I think, is more important even than any physical change. Because, like, this team just needs a fresh perspective, and, like, that's part of, like, with Daryl being a force behind the bench... Then you have a guy like a Lucic who is vocal enough and engaging enough and all of that. And also has the respect of Daryl Sutter. Yeah, that between like all of those things, and he's won a cup before. Like, Giordano's, I think, played three playoff series. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it, it's hard, you know, like when somebody who... It's tough to be told how to do it by someone who's never done it. Exactly. It, and, you know, like, that's not a criticism of Giordano. Like, it's, he's played with Calgary. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like, we've sucked for his yep. entire tenure. So it makes sense. But, you know, it's one of those things that, moving forward, like, this team needs to have a, 
more of a leadership oriented like veterans that are brought in they need to have been at least somewhere deep in the playoffs not necessarily you cup need, winners you need to bring in successful guys yeah guys who know what it takes to win yeah because like daryl's been there he's won the cup twice you've had lucic who's been to the finals a couple of times and won the cup once you know like you need more of that so that way like when you get into the playoffs and say you have a guy struggling you can have lucic or whomever sit the guy down and say okay this is what you need to do and you know work through the psychological aspect of playing in the playoffs which that's been part of why the flames have struggled so mightily is that they're really bad at reacting to adversity when new things are thrown at them and i think even outside the playoffs having luch be able to talk to you between periods and say guys that one was not good the next yeah. two need to be better ready yeah. go team yeah well and also like part of like when i was mentioning earlier this season like this team you don't see them chattering on the bench and talking to each other and holding each other accountable to each other and you know like this team needs to know that every player on the team has each other's back and where like this team has kind of been like a collection of talented individuals basically since the 0506 lockout and it's you know, it's hard to win as a team if you're a collection of individuals. I think the other thing you need from your captain is you need a captain that's willing to do what it takes. And we even saw that with Jerome, right? Jerome would go drop the gloves when he needed to to get his team going. I think that's another thing that Lucic has. Lucic will drop the gloves if he needs to. Lucic will make a big hit if he needs to. Lucic will do what he needs to do to fire up his team. Yeah, and Giordano is very much a leadership by example of how to play hard on the ice, which that's good. But I think on and off the ice, he's going to keep himself in shape and his fitness and that sort of thing. But y you need to have more. And, and I'm not, how do you say, it? I know I've been criticizing Jordan a lot lately and he is a, an extremely good player. And like, I am a huge Giordano fan it's just that it's sort of like when uh, Glenn Gullitson was the coach. Tactics, he was a very good tactical X's and O's guys, but actually dealing with people, he was absolutely horrible, and it screwed up. And, like, Giordano is very much a good leader by example if he's got an A on his jersey. He'd be a perfect assistant alternate captain, perfect in that role. But he he just doesn't have that persona to do the, the rest. And I also think that, you know, I agree with you that Gio is a good defenseman. I think there's still value in him as a Calgary Flame. I don't know his contract still matches his uh, production. And I think the biggest thing there is he's been forced into, maybe forced isn't the right word, he's been used as a number one guy when he probably shouldn't be anymore. I still think he's a valuable guy in your top six. But I'm not sure he's still your number one guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, think look, I view him this, as more of a 3-4. Yeah, I mean, I think looking at this pairing or these six next year, I think I would have Tana of Anderson as my first set. I think I'd have Giordano Valimaki as my second. And then whoever else you want to put on your third pair, whether that's Stone, Nesterov, Shillington, whoever else you're going to put there. Yeah, well... I think one of the best things about Giordano is we've seen he can work and make his partner look better. I think he made Brody look better. I think he made Hamilton look better. I think that there's still value there as a veteran leader to work with Valimaki. Oh, I'm. How would you say it? I don't know if there's six and a half million dollars worth of value there. Yeah, well, like that's why I'm suggesting to move Giordano via the expansion draft or otherwise it's not for who Giordano is as a person it's freeing up the six million dollars so that way you can utilize that in a more long-term kind of way let's uh let's look at maybe worst case scenario in that respect Geo sticks around 
they move him at next year at the deadline in his final year. Yep. What do you think then the likelihood is he comes back the next year on a one year at two, like two million? Possible. And I would take him for that. I would send yeah. him to one years until he's no longer effective. Yeah, basically char it. Yeah. Yeah, just bring him in, even if he's not your top guy, if he's your you know second, third pair guy, as long as he's effective, I think there's he brings value to the team, but not I don't know that he's the like we were saying, the best captain at this point. Yeah, and like this team just on the overall needs a shake up and and I'm not, and I've been critical of, well, I shouldn't say critical. I've been talking about moving Goudreau. And I think part of that is, like you said, I don't know that he's the best uh, fit here in terms of what we need behind the scenes. There's a lot of, um, th- there's been a lot of stuff come out over time, and maybe he's not the most cooperative and that sort of thing. But I think more than anything, I just think it's time to move him to get value. I think that there's value there. I think we need to trade our way into what we need. And that's why I've said we should move Goudreau's. I just think that there's value to be had. And sometimes, you know, you love a player and sort of like you were saying, management doesn't want to move them. But if you look at what a good player will get you, you'll get a player you love just as much. Yeah. And how would you say Goudreau's the one player like I, I've advocated trading him as well, but that's one that you have to thread the needle on because frankly like this team doesn't have any dynamic talent outside of him and so like if you're trading him and you don't hit the mark with that trade and you're getting a guy with potential to be of that caliber Mm -hmm. then you're go you're instantly going into rebuild mode I think the other question there is, and we've asked this, how well does Kachuk bounce back from whatever's going on, whether it's a concussion, a mental issue? I think that Kachuk is your top line left winger of the future. He's the guy they mm. want to build around. I don't know that with Kachuk and Goudreau, you're going to be able to give them both the money that they're going to want when they renew. I think if the team has to pick one, they pick Kachuk over Goudreau. So I think that at some point Goudreau gets moved, whether now or next year the deadline. But you're right; they have to they have to make sure they're getting a player of like or like potential to bring that dynamic piece to the team. Yeah, because frankly, like this team, like they don't have any. Like you look at other teams that are coming up; like they have two or three guys that look like what Monaghan and Gaudreau did when they were first emerging into the NHL. The Flames don't have that. And they don't have it on the the NHL team as it stands right now. So... And I think the benefit on Gaudreau is you could kick the ball forward. You could wait and see what is next year's right wing, you know, free agent class look like and maybe make that deal next year the deadline knowing you can get that guy next well, offseason. Well, like that's why with all of these things that we've been discussing, like the only move that I really want to see this offseason is Giordano moved basically. Uh, like uh, for the rest of it, like Goudreau, Monahan, Kachuk, all of that, I think that it's better to wait a, because uh, if you trade Gaudreau now versus, say, at the trade deadline next year, you're not going to get any more or less for Gaudreau in that situation. It's same with Monahan. Monahan, you're probably going to get more if he bounces back. Same with Kachuk if you decide to move him. So, like, really, there's no urgency to move those assets until you get that right deal. And because I think this team still has the collection of parts, you have to see if Daryl can work his magic to get everybody on that same page with minimal effort. Otherwise, like, you know, you are, you could easily be looking at a three, four year rebuild and that's, you know, may end up being necessary at the end of the day, but you'd rather, not. I don't know that I don't know that it is. I think that we have the assets with the names we've talked about to trade our way into whatever we need. Even though those are younger roster players, I don't think that we need to go into rebuild mode. I think if you move 
Let, let's assume that we don't lose any of them to the expansion draft. Let's assume that we get value. So you trade Goudreau, you trade Monaghan, you trade Giordano. I think you can trade your way into value with those guys where you might dip for a season or two, but then between free agent signings, maybe giving Mangiapane more responsibility, Dubé more responsibility, I think you can work your way back out of this with the lineup you have. Entirely possible. If Kachuk bounces back, like I think if this team goes into what you've talked about a lot this season, let's call it a full scale rebuild. I think that um, I think it's a it shows that assets haven't been managed correctly. Yeah, uh, I can agree with that, and it's one of those. You know, yeah, it might part- take a couple of years if we draft a guy from to come up, but I think you can kind of keep your head above water until that point. Yeah, because, like, right now, like, I basically view the Flames as being very similar to what the St. Louis Blues were after, like, they're, they got, like, guys like Tarasenko, but, like, they still kind of sucked. And it, like, they had to figure out and massage the team a bit and, like, continually work at turnover in their organization until they got the right mix and then they won the Stanley Cup, mm-hmm. and I think that, like, this team, they have a lot of talent. They have plenty of good young defensemen. The four of them are really good. Uh, uh, Shillington less so, but, you know, we also have to let him play, which it makes sense because the expansion draft to not, but, you know. And with Connor Mackey, too. You know, like, they, they do have a number of good young defensemen. And I think like, even outside of St. Louis, look at Chicago. I'm not saying these guys are as good as Kane and Taves. I'm not saying they're as good as, you know, Sidney Crosby. But, you know, they didn't just, okay, Crosby's here, and all this talent fell into the boat. It took a few years to build up the talent around them. Oh, and to the, give the guys Penguins that didn't have the, a shot. The Penguins, that, when that Crosby chance. was in his first year, they were terrible. Yeah, like I think they had like the second or third worst record and ended up drafting Jordan Stahl second overall. But even like, when you look at those teams, whether it's St. Louis, like you said, a terrible Penguins team, Chicago, they didn't just all of a sudden go get, uh, you know, a bunch of vets and, and won a cup. They built internally. And I think that's part of yeah. what this team has to do with Mongepani, with Dubé, with Godden, with Ruzhishka, with whoever it is they decide those guys are. You need to make, you know, you need to be moving. Yes, you need some veterans. And all those teams you'd mentioned, even St. Louis, went out and got some veterans to augment things, which we've done with yeah. Lucic, guys like that. But you need to make the room to build internally. Yeah. And like uh, the Flames have also been in a bit of a weird spot the last two seasons where like uh, their prospects at the AHL level, like the couple of guys that they had graduated between Dubé and Majapane and Shillington. Like, that was basically their farm team. Mm-hmm. And th- now they've got a bunch of other guys, which are, you know, the Rujitskas, the Phillips, the Philp, um, Pedersen, that are also good and potential NHL players, but they need time in the A. It, just like Pelte and Zari will next year. At, like Wolf will, and you know, like the Flames need to. I think of those guys you mentioned, I think there will be a number of them that will come up. I think you look at the guys we brought in this year, Levo, Simone, um, you know, those guys, I think they'll all be out of here, and I think yeah. we'll look to fill those spots with some of those young players. And while they might not be top six players, they're going to get regular NHL jobs to prove what they can do. Yeah, I agree. Like, I would expect Ruzitska to be in the lineup next year, and we'll see with the others just because. And I, th- and I think it'll be a younger overall lineup because of that, but you need those veterans to, to be with those guys and show them the ropes and wor- and be on their line and that sort of thing. Oh, for sure. And how would you say, talent evaluation-wise, the scouts have been doing a really good job of getting skilled guys in the organization like right from 2011 when we got Gaudreau all the way forward like they've done a fairly decent job of getting skill guys period and now it's just more of keeping the NHL basically stocked enough and the 
so that way those kids can get the time that they need to adequately develop in Stockton or other where other places so then they can transition easily into the NHL as contracts expire as trades need to be made yada 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 and, and I but think going back like to what right you were now, saying earlier about you know not getting in, not loving guys I think you've also got to know when it's time to move on from those guys you can't just keep them around because they're your draft pick or your you know, young player. I think at some point you have to say, I'm just making something up here, but hey, Rajishka's not developing the way we want him to. Let's move on to somebody else. Yeah, for sure. And we've done that with guys like Klimchuk and Poirier in the past. And I think that, like, what... Like, the Flames were kind of in this weird spot where, like, all of their guys basically were on the NHL team or in juniors or college or wherever. And, like, the, they hit a little hiccup where there wasn't really anything at the the AHL level. And so, like, part of, um, like, the reticence to move on from guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan right away, even though, like, you might uh, expressly intend on trading those guys, is that you need the pipeline to be basically flowing at all three levels at the same time. And like right now, like there is an ebb at the AHL level where really only Gaudin and uh, Ruzitska amongst the forward prospects are looking NHL ready right this second. Phillips possibly, but I think he's more of a top six or bust guy. I don't think you can slot him in uh, as your fourth line left winger. But I also don't think that there's any top six position for him next year. So I think that you've got to say, are you willing to keep him in the A and maybe overripen him? Yeah, uh, I think you do. So, I mean, these are all questions. And I think no matter how we look at this, whether we acquire through trade, whether we're looking at bringing up a lot of those young guys, I think that especially on the forward side, Matt, you and I can both agree the Calgary Flames are going to look very different next year. Mm -hmm. Even if the top six don't change much, and those bottom six are going to look completely different. Yeah. You know, no, probably no Ryan, no Levo, no uh, Richie. Like, I think you'll see God and Ruzhishka. You'll see a lot of guys promoted internally into those positions. Yeah. Um, and, and again, for better or for worse, whether we are a, a playoff team or a contender next year is yet to be, uh, yet to be seen. But I think that you need to... You need to build internally. Yeah, it's really hard to tell with this team what they are. You know, is like what we've seen this past month what this team will be next year? Is it just a flash in the pan because we're near the end of the year? I don't know. And, you know, that question will linger until they actually execute next year and we'll see. And I think part of what we've seen this year goes to what we heard Sean Monahan saying on 31 Thoughts uh, with Elliot Friedman. He was a guest on that show as well this past week. And, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to necessarily harp on an old coaching staff that's not here, but uh, he said that he wasn't given, in his opinion, a fair shake in Calgary, and he never had any stability. And that's something that we haven't talked as much about. He said every night it was different lines, different teammates, different minutes, different positions. Yeah, And you, you do that when you're trying to make something work, but it's also hard when, I mean, you don't even know what position you're going to play. You don't know how many minutes you're going to play. A good team, you know who the top two lines are. You might shuffle them a little bit, but you know these are our top six, these are our bottom six. And I think that's one thing that Daryl's going to bring is a little more stability in that in that department. Yeah, well, Sam Bennett, um, he... Uh it was a confluence of he was messing up and the team didn't trust him because he was messing up. Yeah. You but know, he's not the only he's not no. the only guy who got moved around and No, but um like You're right though. Bennett's there, Bennett's a unique case. You know, because like any time Sam Bennett was in the offensive zone and he turned the puck over, his first instinct instantly was to go and hook the guy. Yeah. And that's where he took a lot of penalties. And it's hard if you're mm -hmm. wanting to give this guy top six minutes. 
if he turns over the puck in a crucial time, you don't need him going and taking a penalty when you're trying to get a goal. I think and Bennett's so- a great example of what you talked about earlier with that idea of, you know, not moving on from guys that we like or been here forever. Yeah. I know. And like it's frustrating to see. You're right. He he was he'd take dumb penalties, you try to give him top six minutes, he'd blow it, and they'd wonder why he wasn't in the top six. Yeah. And like that's where like why this team needed a good coach because a good coach would have sat Sam Bennett down and tell him that, you know, like, this is what you're doing wrong. This is how you correct it. And, you know, to Bennett's credit this season, he was a lot better with the dumb penalties. And he was even here getting more of an opportunity before he got traded because he w- was doing the proper things and he wasn't taking dumb penalties and he you know and I think that if the flames had held on to him I understand why they traded him and it was the right call even though he's taken off elsewhere because you can't you you can't have a guy demanding a trade several years in a row and keep him and you know without alienating every but other player in the organization Because it's like, well, dude, if you don't want to be here, get out. And so that's, you know. I I think it was the right decision. Yeah. It's one of those that, yeah, it sucks that. And I even said that. Like, if I was a GM of another team, the number one guy on my list of players to acquire would be Sam Bennett. Because, well, as you see with Florida, he's kind of kicking some serious behind there. And, you know, it's... One of those things that it's unfortunate that it had to work out that way, and I'm pissed off that, frankly, that Bennett didn't take those steps sooner, so that way he could just be here and be the Flames' second-line center next year, which is probably what would have happened had he not... always come back. I know. No deal for next year. But I think where it goes down to, though, is that idea, like you said earlier, that we kept giving Bennett chances. We kept giving him chances. And it's one thing for the coach to tell you what not to do, you know, but it's another to actually do it. I mean, you know, your parents tell you, don't do this dumb thing. And when you do it, they punish you, right? Yeah. Matt, don't, you know, knock the kid down at the swings. When they do, something happens to you. It's one thing to just say, don't do that, Matt. I've told you for the 50th time, don't hook the guy. I think at some point you got to sit him down. And I think that, you know, this is one thing that players respond well when they're playing. And I think you need a coach who it doesn't matter if you're, you know, Johnny Goudreau or Brett Ritchie. It doesn't matter if you're Josh Levo or Matthew Kachuk. If you're not doing what you need to do, you need to be put in the appropriate place in the lineup. And if that's not in the lineup, then so be it. And I think that Daryl's one of those guys that isn't going to put up with a lot of that. And he gave Sam, I would say, more chances than the previous regime did. Because Sam is a Daryl Sutter player. But in the end, as we were talking about earlier today, it's about getting value. And I think that we looked at that player and said we got the value we needed out of him. No, and frankly, Bennett at this point in his Flames career was looking like a fourth-line player. And the Flames Mm. got two second-round picks for a fourth-line player. That is a home run of a trade from our end. Yeah. Yeah, he developed quickly into a top-six forward with Florida, and that's good for Florida. But, you know, he was not that player here. And that's... And I think, and I think going back to what you're, we were talking about with Kachuk of, you know, is it one year? Is Sam Bennett going to look at that next year? Is this sort of a, I'm going to stick it to the Flames type scenario? I think, again, you can't look at his, you know, month and a half he's been in Florida. It's really going to come down to what do we see next year? Oh, for sure. And, like, it, would I bet that he's going to score 60 points next year? I doubt it. Would you bet that he'd be the second line winger on a Florida team that's looking as good as they are, or the second line center on a Florida team that's looking as good as they are now? Possibly, but it, yeah, I, I doubt it. Like uh, Florida just seems to be the island of misplaced toys that where everything just seems to be working out for them this year. And I think he is a motivator, too. I think it's show Calgary they were wrong. And also, crap, I got a contract expiry. Let's uh, go play well so I can make some money. Yeah, exactly. Because now, like, there's no loyalty between the Florida Panthers and Sam Bennett. 
No. You're you're just some dude that walked through the door. So you have to go earn your job. And yeah. you know, uh, like it, if Sam Bennett had basically played the the mediocre style that he had, I don't know as if Florida would have even qualified him. No. And I think Sam Bennett is a guy who will have a job next year outside of a fourth line. And there's enough teams that are looking for centers that he can probably be a two, three center somewhere. But I don't think that this small burst in Florida is indicative of what he's going to be for the rest of his career. Yeah. And we'll see. Uh, Good on Bennett for doing his thing. And, you know, hopefully he does have a good career because, you know, I do like Sam Bennett. Mm -hmm. You know, wish him all the best. And the reason I I brought him up, he's not the only one that got shifted around as minutes changed. I mean, when we look at this lineup, everyone's had that. And I think that was part of the issue this year, too, with the Flames, was just not having that stability, not knowing who you're playing with or, you know, guys like a Chuck, are you left? Are you right? Where are you? And and that's got to be hard mentally to prepare for a game too. So I think even just having that stability next year, these are our top six. This is our right winger. You know, Lindholm was left. He was right. You know, they, they didn't convert a defenseman to forward as you always want them to, but otherwise hmm. you, you had no idea where you're going to play besides you're either forward or defenseman. I think we just need some of that stability, like Kachuk said, to be successful. You look at the major teams, nobody else that's, you know, a good Stanley Cup contender shifting their lineup around as much as we do. No. And part of that is just due to certain aspects of this team underwhelmingly underperforming. And Well, and I think also trying to fill holes. I mean, we have to do that because we have big holes in the right. I think if we establish those players, you're not going to have to do that. Yeah, exactly. For better or for worse, you say you are the second line right winger. That's your job. For better or for worse, that's where you're going to be this season. Yep. Unless you not, you know, you steal the first line center, right winger's job, or the third line guy steals yours. Yep, exactly. But it almost feels like right now they go into the dressing room and it's all right. Draw straws for us to play right tonight. You know, and you you need that sorted out. Yeah, exactly. Or you're shoehorning guys like Brett Ritchie in, which you know Ritchie is a fine player if he's on the fourth line. And I actually wouldn't mind him back as long as he's playing on the fourth line. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, if you're playing him on the second line with Monaghan, like, that's a failure of the management to not get something to put there. And I think we're going to see more Brett Ritchie, Matthew Kachuk, um, Sam Bennett-style players next year. More Daryl Sutter type players in this lineup. And that's something that the flames have lacked frankly like when's the last time that the flames other than Derek england have had a truly mean defenseman like you have to go all the way back to regeer and i don't even know that has to be a defenseman though no i know but i'm just highlighting specifically on defense like the flames haven't had like they've had most of their defensemen for the last 10 years have been that slickly skilled two-way guy or just you know a defensive defenseman trying not to screw up and like there's no intensity from the blue line at all and i think that that's an area that the team needs to address just to have somebody to clear bodies out of the front other than that, I think same thing on the forward side. I think you look at a you know a Johnny Goudreau and Sean Monahan if they're your pairing, and you need somebody who can dig in the corner and get the puck back to those guys. Yeah, and, and that's what Kachuk does when he's at his best, but he's one of you know twelve. Exactly, and the Flames, I think they need more size, more skill. I and I think that, um, well, more speed. I was. As well, I think that like if they can get somebody who's a good player on the boards at retrieving pucks, and you know, thankfully the guys that are coming up organizationally, Zari and Pelty, that is one of their strengths. Is that, but you just need more of that, and Mm -hmm. I think you almost need a little bit of sandpaper on every line. The way this team's made up, 
Yeah, and it's not necessarily, like, needing, a, oh, we need, like, four guys that are, like, six foot five just to... Well, you, you don't know. you don't need more McGrattans or Christoph Oliwa or Chris Simon, but I think you need more guys like Lucic. You can do a little bit of everything. Matthew Kachuk can do a little bit of everything. Sam Benedict can do a little bit of everything. Yeah, exactly. And like this team, like you look at like a team like uh, Winnipeg, where like a lot of their players are both big and skilled. Like that 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 team as a team to me, does not look any different talent-wise than what the Calgary Flames was this season. And yet they finished well in the playoffs just due to speed and size with some of their players. And and I don't even think they have to be big players. And this is often a misconception. You need big, nasty guys. You can get guys like, you know, Milan Lucic, who isn't a huge guy. Um, you know, there's guys that are just tough. You know, you look at even Zach Ronaldo, not a huge guy, but I think you just need those grit guys on your lineup. Yeah, it's not even... Ronaldo's um, 5'10", 193. It's also like playing small. Like, you take, like, Elias Lindholm and Sean Monahan, right? And Lindholm's a very average-sized guy. I think he's six mm -hmm. foot, And Monahan's 6'3", and yet Lindholm plays bigger than Monahan. Yeah. And you look at guys on Winnipeg, for example, like the you got guys like Blake Wheeler and that, who he's a reasonably skilled player. He's not like a superstar skilled guy, but he's good. But he's also six foot five and he's just harder to knock off the puck with plays where if you have guys like say Monahan who play smaller than they are it, it it just it's a complication and and how much of monahan playing smaller do you think is maybe his injuries and he's not as comfortable with where he's at oh uh, it, that's very could well be it's just that um like the flames need it's not even necessarily getting bigger physically they need to play bigger and play faster mm -hmm. than they have been. And I think that that will go a long way for them to get the success on the ice is playing more brashly. And I think it's brash and I think it's also just confidence. Guys who are in a role they're comfortable with. Yeah. Cause and like, then they, they play that way. They open up and they play more comfortably. Yeah, because, like, when you're trying to rebuild a team like the Flames have been up until recently, um, the hardest thing is getting the overall talent level of your team at a point where you can reliably be a good team. And, like, this year, basically everything went wrong, and the Flames will miss the playoffs by two to six points. You know, and... Like, while that's disappointing, like, everything went wrong this year. And the likelihood of that repeating is not likely given the same... Like, if Daryl had started the year, the Flames are in the playoffs. So, now it's about figuring out how to best get that talent to work properly to win effectively. We have a lot of time to figure that out. We have a whole summer for that, but I think the big question is what we get out of the team over the next week with three games remaining on the schedule. Yeah. it's This is going to be a very... Like, nothing would surprise me with this offseason. Like, if you said, oh, the Flames traded Gaudreau, Monaghan, and Giordano this offseason and are going into a rebuild, it'd be like, yeah, okay, sure. Oh, we went and did this one move or that one move, and you know we're kind of just like hitting the reset button. That would make sense too, and I think that like this off season as a Flames fan will be very interesting to see where they go exactly with it. It really feels like this is the fork in the road. There's three or four directions you can go from here, and they finally have to establish which one they're going to go down, and each one of those has 
long-term strengths and you know benefits and and disadvantages yeah exactly like if you go all in uh and things screw up (laughs) that's not good (laughs) Um, but I, I but I don't think you can you know I don't think you can maybe go down the rebuild route and then go oh we didn't mean to do that you know I think you're gonna make one of these decisions we're either gonna you know continue to go as a contender we're gonna rebuild and that's gonna have long term effects either way and we're finally at this this guidepost that I don't really think the team's been at in a while yeah well I think you have to pretty much go like well back <laughs> um like 80s level back where the flames have been in this position of like where do we go from here and um because like they kept failing when it came to the oilers in the 80s and having to rejiggy things until they managed but yeah we we have no idea where they're gonna go we just have to wait and see yeah it'll be interesting like it like yes, we're Flames fans and all that, but like this would actually like if this was say like the Minnesota Wild was having this season, this would be the team I'd be paying attention to because it's interesting to see just from a fan of seeing how things are done procedurally with teams, um, like and the decision making process of an organization, like seeing what this team will actually do i think like this w- is going to be like the most fascinating team to watch in well, the offseason just for that reason well let's come back to that next week once season's over and we can do a full autopsy of our season because we still have three games to play so let's focus on getting through what we've got left and then we can talk some more next week about we'll look at our yearly predictions that we made we'll talk a little bit more about maybe which direction to go in the off season and we will start to look ahead to the draft as well once the season's over. But Matt, we got three games. Uh, we've already predicted tonight's game, but I'll let you change your prediction if you wanted. We both predicted a loss tonight. Do you want to change tonight's prediction? I think we're going to win out just because that's the Calgary way of And by making... win out, you're saying we're going to win all three. Yeah, uh, just because we're going to get the as bad of a draft pick as possible. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm expecting... Full on wins here now. <laughs> I'm. I don't know. Calgary's going to be able to put together. That'd be what they have two wins already. I said three game win streak earlier is two. So they have what one two. I don't think they're going to put together a five game win streak. I think that we're going to see them uh, win. I, I, I'm going to stay with my loss because I predicted that last week. I'm going to say they lose tonight and then they maybe win the two after that. The back to backs. Uh. I think especially if you're starting to put some young guys in tonight, uh, you might find that there's a little bit of struggle there. And we're still waiting to see who the Flames put in the lineup tonight. There's been some talk that potentially Adam Rajishka can make his NHL debut and Connor Mackey could be in the lineup. So by the time everybody hears this, they'll know uh, what happened in this Vancouver game. But Oh, I and think- uh, congrats to Connor Mackey for making the world championship team for Team USA. Yeah, that's quite an accomplishment for a... I I think it says two things. It's quite an accomplishment for a guy who's not in the NHL. I think it also says, wow, the U.S. team's not deep this year. Yeah. (laughs) Like, when you're calling on AHL guys to play, it means, especially for a big powerhouse like the U.S., most of your best guys are going to be in the playoffs. Yeah, basically. So, good for him. Well, Matt, we'll see how this week turns out. And like I said, next week we'll come back and we'll autopsy the season and talk a little bit more about where they go in the off season and what to expect next. Yeah, and we'll even get a little bit of a sneak peek at the draft and before we do our full-on draft episode and all that. So, Because we'll at least know where we're picking at that point. Roughly. The lottery won't have happened yet. True. Do you want to take us take us out, Matt? Uh, yeah. By the way, the odds of the Flames winning the draft lottery or any of the spots in the draft lottery, uh, yeah, that's not. Well, I'm happen. not saying winning, but we've seen the teams, you know, around where the Flames will be moved three or four positions up or down, and that could affect who they take. True. I'm not saying we'll win it, but you know, we we may end up moving two or three positions up. Yeah. We'll see. Fun times. Anyway, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. 
This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.